Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get Dad for Father's Day? Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row1 and save 15% off your order when you check out Row 1 Brand's Vintage Sports Victorium Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for Dad this Father's Day. If he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 Vintage NFL Helmet Poster. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row1. Great events in history occur. Do witnesses realize the importance? Looking back on my time now, I realize I was one of the lucky ones, privileged to tell the stories of those times. I'm Orville Mulligan, sports writer. The commonly held conception about the 20s was that they quite literally roared. This is not half wrong. After all, why not roar with exultation that the Great War had ended, the Spanish flu epidemic was in the past, a new age of peace and prosperity lay before us. In short, why not celebrate life itself while the living was good? Paradoxically, however, a self-righteous lot, serious in their sobriety, had arisen amid the giddiness and gaiety and in came the prohibition of alcohol. Many folks still believe that the ban on giggle juice defined the U.S. throughout the decade. Also not half wrong. For decades, organized crime had aided and abetted in the throwing of Major League games all the way up to the 19 World Series. Overnight, everyone from Arnold Rothstein and Lucky Luciano to street side wise guys wanted a piece, and it felt like every single one of them owned and operated a gin mill. In 1924, Stefano Monastero and the LaRocca family aren't quite dominating the local bootlegging landscape, but soon. And before they're through, the body count directly related to their operations will be 200 plus. Small potatoes, that is, compared to the damage done for the five families in New York. Over 1,000 known dead. And that doesn't even include missing persons. And the common conception today? Most folks believe that Chicago is the center of everything at once the most exciting and most dangerous city in the USA. And as I was set to find out, this notion wasn't far from wrong at all. But that is the font used in the original design. Yes, I'm sure your son's due will be the social event of the summer. Not aunt, font, font. Like typeface, type face. Yes, yes, of course, our gossip columnist wants to hear about it. As for the kerning, well, you know what, forget it. You sent that ad over. We can't change it the way you want unless you want to pay us for the design. Yes, Miss Philip Hindcliffe III, she will, I'm sure. Can I... Of course we want the business of McKillen Mortuary. This is why we give you the cheapest rates in Pittsburgh already. Yes, we know about it. Can I... That's very gracious offer, sir, considering the mistake was yours. Yes, all right. Goodbye, then. And I guess we have to hope for a run on the stiffs. What? No, that wasn't for you. Yes, I'm sure you'll be inviting only the best of Pittsburgh's living citizenry. Yes, all right. I'll pass on the message, along with the five others you've left today already. Okay. Goodbye. I don't know how you do it. It's a gift. <laughs> know how you do that either. So, what was her name? Pardon? Into the office at the crack of noon comes Orville Mulligan, dressed in the same clothes he wore yesterday and today more than a bit worse for the wear. There's the smug conquering hero look on his mug and bags under the eyes indicating lack of sleep. I don't need an Ivy League degree to do the mathematics. Observant as always, Miss Delph, but a gentleman doesn't kiss and tell. A gentleman wouldn't consort with those women. Oh, you wound me. Chicago. Sorry? Chicago. That's where you're headed, Don Juan. All right. 
The next three trains to Chicago leave approximately 45, 75, and 95 minutes. Travel time varies among them. I'd recommend moseying on over there earlier rather than later. I've booked you at the Carlisle. That's within staggering distance of South Station. You'll be covering the Illinois-Chicago game on Saturday. Practices are on Friday. On Sunday, you're to cover the Chicago Cardinals-Dayton Triangles game. Aye, the Cardinals. Starring Patty Driscoll, pride of the American Irish. Very amusing. <laughs> Say, what gives with the runaround? I'm sure I don't know what you mean. You know, the whole iceberg treatment. At this rate, you'll be calling me Mr. Mulligan by dusk. It's just that... I thought maybe your behavior might... I've made a slight miscalculation. Now, Chicago. Ah, Chicago. What a great town that is. Just great. Have you ever been to the old Windy City, son? No, sir. I am looking forward to the opportunity. Great, great. Listen, you just have to remember three things. Keep your eyes open, your head down, and your ear to the ground. I'm not sure that's physically possible. Now listen, kid. When you're there, sure, you'll be covering the Loyola game and the Bears game. That's the U-Chicago game and the Cardinals game. Right, the uh, Chicago and the, uh, the games. You'll be covering the game, sure, great. But do some digging, too. Get newsy. Don't get yourself plugged or anything so drastic, but, but don't be afraid to stick your neck out for the story if so you... So he's got head down, neck out, eyes open, and ear to the ground. Father, you may have created a whole new sport. Ah, uh, what a sense of humor. Just great. Marla, darling, have you funded Orville here? Yes, here you are, Orville. Great, great. As perfect as ever. Good luck, Orville. Now, Marla, let's get back to it. Now that the damn election is over, we can get back to reporting on criminals other than the politicians. Like advertisers. Has uh, Richard gotten back to you? Unfortunately, not yet. It's a shoe store. Do they realize how many shoe stores are... I'll spare you the dime store philosophy about the entire spectrum of humanity, or even a decent-sized spectrum of Pittsburgh citizenry. Suffice to say, it takes... Hey, get a load of this. In Pittsburgh, they left the hobos in the train station. Nah, look at his clothes. He's too poor to be a hobo. Yeah, he must be a sports writer or something. A bit early for ginger ale, isn't it, boys? The Dukes provides. Shh! Not so loud! We'll have to share with everybody. So, are you coming aboard or what? Ah, so this must be the degenerate section. Reservations only! Max? Huey? Mr. Dougal? Dukes, Dukes, call me Dukes. We have this conversation every time. Shuffle it over, Max. Oh! And here we go! The journey of 1,000 miles must begin with a single drink. Cheers! The Reagan Athletic Club was once known as the Morgan Athletic Club, and this is not to be confused with the Morgan Athletic Club founded by Chris O'Brien. Now there's a good Irishman for you, laddies. Cheers! Cheers. James Reagan was the true player. Just a massive, beefy monster of a guy. An immovable lineman on the offense, an unstoppable force on the defense. O'Brien didn't take him over to Racine Park, probably because old Jimmy liked your kind only slightly better than he liked Negroes. But he was a top player in Chicago football beginning right when he started in 1900. 1900? So you would have been what, Dukes? About 55? 
I remember courting Ma Reagan back in 45. <laughs> Why did you let these two out of their cage, Mr. Dougal? Well, I heard there was a few cockfights in Chicago, so I figured I'd bring a couple of entrants with me. Over for two leaders. Did Dukes even make it back? Not quite yet. Anybody care to bet? How long has it been since he's had to run like that? Probably the last time he made one of those train station bottle swaps. Let's just hope he remembered to bring some glasses. Go Dukes! 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 I hope you jackals realize you're not getting none of this. All jokes and kidding aside, Dukes, how about getting us into Reagan's club this time? We'll see, Junior, we'll see. Sheesh! How'd you like this guy? What's the problem, Max? Every time for the past three years when I'm in Chicago with this guy, he tells me about how great Reagan's club is. And every time we ask him to get us in there, he says, We'll see, boys, we'll see. Then he gives me some cloak and dagger routine, ditches us, and goes and gets thoroughly smoked all by himself. Oh, boy, do I. <laughs> then he finds us the next day and regales us with tales of the city's best hooch, broads to die for, and the like, my larky. And this time, Orvie boy, it seems you'll have the distinct displeasure of experiencing old Dukesy's teasing right along with us. Listen, I've got a reputation to consider, fellows. I can't have you getting uncontrollably soused and chasing tail in what is otherwise a reputable establishment. Reputable establishment? If it were a reputable establishment, we wouldn't want to go there. Neither would Dukes. I'd be willing to go there just for a story. Oh, horse feathers, come on. No, really. An interview with Frank Reagan, instigator of the Chicago race riots? Alleged instigator of the Chicago race riots. Frank Reagan, he's connected to Johnny Torrio, crime kingpin. Allegedly connected to Johnny Torrio. Alleged crime kingpin. There's a great story there, I'm telling you. Just listen to this guy. I'm going to possibly the best gin mill in all Chicago, and maybe the entire United States. And I want to talk to a guy who will have me measured for concrete boots before I leave the place? Oh, you two hyenas can laugh it up. But if your mangy selves do manage to get into Reagan's, it'll be because of the gumption of Orville here. about those two? Ah, I'll get them to where they need to go. I know half the cabbies in this city. I'm sure you do, Mr. Dougal. Best cabbies in the world. Well, what about you, kid? Can you find your squad? My directions tell me it's that. No, this way. All right, good luck, kid. May I help you? Ah, oh, I was enjoying that. Two dings is quite enough. Sorry? You ding the bell once, leave an appropriate amount of time for one to traverse the distance from the back. Once the time has elapsed, you may ring a second time, after which the appearance of myself or some other unfortunate desk clerk will most certainly be at your service post-haste. What is that, bell etiquette? Yes, if you like. Bell etiquette. So what if I ding three times, but really quickly, like... Sir, please, you're going to wear it out. Name? Of the bell? Your name. Of course my name. Why would anyone give a bell a name? I was merely jesting. Yes, sir. How very droll, sir. Name, sir. Mulligan. Orville. Writer. Sports. Hmm. Pittsburgh Guardian. Yes, that's it. Never heard of that one. Room 116, up the stairs to the left. You know something? You're all right. Oh, thank you, sir. And thank you for your excellent hospitality. Good evening. Oops, better not forget my keys. Good evening.
I discovered quite early in my days at Penn that I'd been blessed with a constitution nicely amenable to drinking lots of alcohol. More precisely, I've never had a hangover. I suspected my compatriots weren't faring quite as well. Well now, good day to you all. Mr. Dougal? Dukes, Dukes, call me Dukes. As you wish, Mr. Dougal. Say, what's with the corpses? Is there another war on? Yeah, the, the war against ethanol. These two casualties met their gruesome fate this past evening. Is that Orville? Yes. Does he look like himself? Yes. I hate Orville. Well, I'm starving. Say, are you going to eat that? What about that? Huey? Uh, not us. Well, that is quite the useful talent, I must say. Probably even more so if they ever re-legalize. Ah, just your typical Irishman's constitution. How do you explain that sorry mess there, then? He may not be a true Irishman. Maybe we should get a blood test. Or go to the phrenologist. What a load of... More coffee, Dukesy dear? Maybe a spatula to pry Junior off the table? Oh, no thanks, darling. Unlike my young compatriots here, I'm going to start moving. Boys, I'm in a generous mood, so I'll pick up this tab. Oh, great looks and a big spender. Marry me, gorgeous. Now that's disgusting. What about you, skinny? You want anything what you're not having? Do you have cherry pie? Best in Chicago. Or at least this part of Chicago. Or, all right, it's pretty good. Melt me a slice of cheese on that and we have a deal. Or you and Mr. Dougal have a deal. Mr. Dougal? How very cute. I didn't think anyone called you that, sugar. Only this crank. All right, boys, I'll catch up with you later. More likely, you'll catch up with me. Until then... He's starting early with the boozing. Enough with the talk about boozing. So what about that? You gonna eat that? These guys look good, but I don't see how anyone's stopping Grange. Ah, come on. If anyone can figure out Red Grange, it's Stag. He didn't quite do that last time. Grange 6, University of Chicago nothing was the score, if I'm not mistaken. Ah, here comes Boss Stag. You better rouse Huey. Good morning, gentlemen. I will be keeping this brief today, as our boys have much to do before tomorrow's game. Starting with the obvious, Coach. Who do you have that can stop Red Grange? He read my mind. Low-hanging fruit, my friend. Red Grange is, beyond all doubt, one of the greatest players ever developed. But let me remind you, esteemed members of the press, that football is a simple game. It is a team game. On Saturday, 11 men will be on that field at one time, and as one team, and it is the responsibility of that single unit collectively to prevent any advancement toward our goal line. You ask who we have to stop Red Grange? And I answer that the University of Chicago has 11 of this country's finest players to do so. Why do half of the coaches in college football believe they have the best 11 players in the country? You'd figure one of them would do the math. Coach, what about the rumors that you've got headhunters in your starting lineup whose sole intent is to take Grange out? Despite the gossip out there, some of which creeps into your publications, Illinois alumni and supporters may be assured that no member of our team will intentionally attempt to injure Grange. However, the Chicago players are not going to arch their bodies to save Red Grange from harm, either. In short, we will employ any means necessary to stop Grange, but within the rules set forth. Coach Stagg, this weekend two professional games are being played in Chicago. What's your opinion on the National Football League? (laughs) You must be an out-of-towner. All the local boys here are well-versed in my position on that subject. For your edification, however, I will state the college educated should seek employment benefiting a gentleman, not by peddling physical skill. I tell you here and now, the wisest thing I ever did was turn down an offer to play in New York back in 88 for $4,000. To cooperate with professional football games, especially on Sunday, is to cooperate with forces destructive to the noblest elements of amateur sport. And now, gentlemen, good day to you all. All right, men. First team in the eye. Set it up. Set it up. Coach Zupke. Coach Stagg says his team is pledged to, quote, stop Red Grange by any means necessary, unquote. What's your response? Mr. Staggs is certainly willing to try every means at his disposal. I predict he will ultimately be unsuccessful. Uh, But never mind that. I'd put my man against his boys without red and still win. 
Is Red gonna play after getting his chomper knocked out here today? It's a tooth, Artie. It's not like he tore up his knee. Jeez. He got back in the scrimmage ten minutes afterward. Coach, if Red gets any money from the Tooth Fairy, would that be a violation of NCAA rules? <laughs> <laughs> Coach Stagg claims his men don't drink, don't smoke, and don't go out carousing. He has his players on a no-meat diet and doesn't even use cuss words. How does he do it, Coach? My players don't drink, but that's because they're smart enough to realize it's against the law. My players don't smoke because they're smart enough not to. They don't need to be told these simple facts. As far as his men, I'm, I'm sure Mr. Stagg gets tip-top discipline from every man he has because he has zero. <laughs> With his Christian manners, he calls this one a jackass and another and another, and by the end of the workout, there's no men left, only 22 jackasses grazing on the grass. Well, that's probably where the vegetarianism comes from. <laughs> Coach, word has it that Grange is getting looks from professional football clubs. How will he stack up on the pro league? Well, I couldn't care less. I realize it's a free country, that Mr. Harold Edward Grange can pursue whatever enterprise he wishes after he leaves this school. But simply put, football is not a game to be played for money. Now, who the hell... Hey, Red. Red, give us a smile. Sure to impress the ladies. Does it hurt, Red? Only when I smile. <laughs> Red, how did you get in such great shape? Ice. Coach keeps us fit during the season, but in spring and summer I do a lot of ice carrying back in Wheaton for Mr. Thompson. Lots of folks live upstairs in Wheaton, and those blocks are good and heavy. Red, any comment on the rumors that you played pro ball in Green Bay under an assumed name? Just what you said. They're rumors. I've said it before, and I'll have to say it again, I guess. I never played football for anyone except Illinois and Wheaton High School. Still, you're only here for one more season. Have you not given a thought to going pro? Fellas, the only thing I'm thinking about lately is hitting the pillow after Coach Zupke's workouts and then dreaming of running over a bunch of University of Chicago tacklers. The team I want to play for is on this practice field right now, Illinois. What the hell? Doogie, what in blue blazes are you doing bringing these apes out here? Get that, Wappa. I think the pit squeak just called us apes. Do you think it's worth our time to teach a lesson? Well, try me, blockhead. <laughs> a gentleman, a gentleman, please. Uh, apologies, Coach Zubke. I did not mean to cause trouble. Merely to connect my associates here with a member of the assembled media. Dukes, if anyone else had pulled this kind of a stunt, he wouldn't be walking out here on his own legs. Mr. Grange? Red Grange? I'm a big fan. I'm uh, not sure I can say the same. I am so sorry to hear that. Hey, maybe when you're done with the eggheads next year, you can play for Reagan's Colts. But enough, Dukes. Now, take these individuals off my field. As if we don't have enough problems without having some two-bit thugs trying to pay off my players and, and God knows what else. Right away, Orville. Uh, let's go. This is your ride. My ride? Some flivver, huh, kid? I didn't think a car could be this quiet. Reagan's Colts riding style. You never ridden in a Packard before? Never anything like it. I've got more experience with a sort of malfunctioning boiler on wheels. Allow me to make formal introductions. The clean-cut fellow at the wheel is Scruffle. Whereas his, like say, more compact companion goes by the subricate of Whopper. Both are members of the Reagan Colt Sports Club. Scruffle, Whopper, this is Orville Mulligan. Mulligan? You mean we're taking a mulligan? <laughs> I sent word through Reagan regarding your desire to meet with him, and he likely sent these boys here to escort you back to your hotel. Yeah, the boss sent us here to scope you out. Scruffle and me are excellent judges of character. So how do you like the Sox chances this year? The White Sox? Well... Jesus, Scruffle, cut it with that. They got no chance. They got nobody. What do you mean? What about Collins? Ah, uh, Collins is about 52 years old. Besides, they're gonna make him manager. He ain't gonna have the time to play. All right, what about Hooper? Harry Hooper? Are you sauced already? He also ain't no Joe Jackson, right? Old Mulligan stew? Well, Joe Jackson was... Truth is, the league will keep him down for 100 years because of the 19 series. Stupid monk should have never been caught. 
Jeez, if I'd been a Rothstein, I'd had one of the players' zots way before the trial. You're completely screwy. You bump off one of the socks, and soon the whole American League goes down, and there's no more betting at all. <laughs> all right, Mulligan. Here's your stop. But this isn't the Carlisle. Nah, but we're headed elsewhere. The Carlisle's about two miles that way. All right. Hey, it's better than eight miles, right? Now, Vamoose, we got to get out of here. Don't worry, we'll tell the boss you're all right, and you're dead correct about the socks. Until then. As I understand it, Mr. Albert Einstein's theories tell us that time is relative, that what seems to take place in a single moment may appear to unfold over eons to a distant observer. At that particular moment, I was finding it difficult to believe that Dr. Einstein had invented his theory in Switzerland 1905, and not Chicago 1924. Hours worth of motion and activity passed before my eyes, a mile cram-packed with bodies in motion relative to time. The horse traffic, a symbol of the slow-moving past. The automobiles, a reach for the future. Here and there, a soul forced to deal with the present. And every once in a while, all three meet in one individual. reality has not lived up to its promise and has proven a failure. Its influence on the present day workforce has been negative. Its effect on future generations grave. I urge all women who see the unforetold harm brought about by the 18th Amendment to join this cause. Women brought about the 18th Amendment and women can overturn it. Amen, sister. Well, hello, tourist boy. You have an extra smoke for a lady? Sure. Say, that's a literal soapbox you've got. What's the matter? They don't have public speaking in, what, Buffalo? Pittsburgh, actually. And no, not as such. No one's talking about repeal of prohibition back home. The women there are more preoccupied with equality. Women? Or the one woman I'm thinking of? What makes you say that? I don't know too much about you, mister, but you're not exactly difficult to read. You're even thinking of her now. Uh, actually, I was thinking about the story I need to file. Ah, a newsie. Sports writer, actually. A sportsy, then. Good to meet you. Thanks for the Gasper and enjoy Chicago. It's loads of fun. What? Sorry, sportsy. Places to go, people to see. <laughs> Good evening, welcome to... Oh, it's you. Good evening, sir. May I again please request you observe the agreed-upon bell etiquette? Pardon me, just having a bit of... I'd like to use your telephone, if I could, for a call. A business call. I have to call in my story. Indeed. Number? Homestead 1010, Pittsburgh. Yes, operator. Homestead 1010 in Pittsburgh, please. Thank you. That's got a nice ring to it, doesn't it? What's that, sir? Homestead 1010. That could be a radio jingle. Homestead 1010. Sir, the desk bell is not for creating jingles. Thank you, operator. Sir? Thank you. Pittsburgh Guardian, timely news for modern citizens. Hello, Marla. It's good to hear from you. That's sweet of you, Orville, but you called here, remember? It was three seconds ago. Correct as always, Marla. Hey, I was just telling the clerk here at the hotel, wouldn't Homestead 1010 make a great radio jingle? Like, Homestead 1010. Yes, very clever. You are quite the jingle-minded fellow. Now, do you have a story to file, or have you been on a 24-hour booze and boudoir binge? Haven't touched any. Uh, of either. Today, at least. Well, congratulations. Story? Uh, yes. All right. Okay. Title. Stag, colon. Any means to stop Grange. You can work on that if you need to. Oh, I will. Lead. The plan of the Chicago Maroons for stopping Red Grange, question mark. Quote, we will employ any means necessary, unquote, in Coach Stagg's estimation, period. First line of defense in the literal and figurative senses will be Chicago's gargantuan linemen Gowdy and Henderson, period. Both tip the scales at 200 pounds or more, period. 
the big men will be looking to quash Grange's superb off-tackle plunges for which he has gained national renown, period. Coach Zupke believes his fighting Illini have little to fear from the undefeated Maroons and remains confident his team will triumph, comma, even in the unlikely happenstance of neutralizing Grange, period. The junior halfback, comma, certain to be an All-American, comma, has heretofore hit pay dirt a dozen times this season, and his Illinois team has humbled opponents by the cumulative score of 169 to 30, period. Expectation for this football game at Stag Field surpasses that of any other match to date in this rivalry between the universities of Chicago and Illinois, period. In addition to putting their undefeated and untied mark on the line, the visitors could also fall from the top spot in the Big Ten Championship standings, period. And Kids, feel free to work your magic. I certainly will, though I'm not sure it's the kind of magic you're used to from a girl. Say, what gives with the Ice Queen routine, Marla? I'm sorry, Orville. I just don't have the time for this right now. Really? What, is there a problem at the paper? Nope. Everything's running swimmingly. Yours was the last story I was waiting for, and now I'm off. Off? Where to? Jack's taking me out. He wants to see the new Chaplin picture. Jack? The pickle flinger? Yes, Jack. The heir to the biggest canned goods company in the northeastern United States. Marla, he's 16. It's been ages since I've been to the pictures. So you'll be calling in another story tomorrow. Straight after the final whistle. I'm thrilled to hear it. Now have a great time. Bye. Thanks. Our pleasure, sir. Say, is there a Chaplin flick playing anywhere near here? I know, I know. Chicago, 1924, the liveliest, most exciting, most unique city in all the world, and I'm watching a movie I could see anywhere in the world. So what else was I supposed to do? Mr. Dougal hadn't gotten back to me. I missed Max and Huey at their hotel. So I went to the movies. Hey, shut up already! We're trying to hear the music! The Pilgrim isn't even one of Chaplin's better movies. You have just listened to Orville Mulligan, sports writer, an audio drama podcast from Number 80 Productions and the Sports History Network. Episode script and story by Oz Davis and Darren Hayes. Research by Joe Ziemba. Orville Mulligan, sports writer, stars Doug Fye, Ilana Fye, and Eric Bodwell. This episode co stars in order of appearance John Roberts. Mike Backus, Vernon Poitras, Joe Gallegos, Mindy Grossberg, Cadman Holland, Scott Leet, Abriana Lavalli, and Don MacGyver. Directing by Eric Bodwell. Sound recording and editing by Don MacGyver. The theme song of Orville Mulligan's sports writer is Dayton Triangle's Rag and was arranged and performed by Bruce Smith. Additional music provided by David Liso of Dynamo Stairs and Mike Monroe and Gene Monroe with Cletus Train Music. Orville Mulligan Sports Writer is produced by Darren Hayes and Oz Davis. Series concept by Darren Hayes. Keep your dial locked to this podcast station for the next exciting episode of Orville Mulligan Sports Writer, coming soon. Mm-hmm.